Okay. So we are, we're in a series called Gifted, where we are looking to God's word to us, the Bible, and what he has to say about the way that he wants to interact with us. Jesus came, God in the flesh, to physically demonstrate God's love for us and physically make it possible for us to have eternal life with our heavenly father. And if Jesus would have just left, would have been like, all right, guys, been a good 33 years, see you later. That would have been like, oh, now all we have is the memory of who Jesus is and what Jesus did, but there is, wouldn't really be an ongoing relationship, which is why Jesus didn't just say, see ya. Instead, he said, I'm going to send another. I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, who is God. He is part of the Trinity, the Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are all equal. There is, the, the Holy Spirit is not like, oh, well, it's the essence of God or it's the, the warm fuzzy of God. The Holy Spirit is God. He empowers us. He directs us. He's all knowing. He's all powerful. He's all present. The Holy Spirit is God. And Jesus told us when he left, look, I'm leaving you physically because physically I can only be wherever I am. Pretty deep, right? But the Holy Spirit will be with you wherever you go. And when you put your faith in Jesus, you are immediately filled with the Holy Spirit of God. It's not something you have to earn. It's not something you have to grow into. It's not something you get on your 18th birthday. It's not something that you, you get if you come to church enough and you, you get enough hole punches in your card. And that the Holy Spirit is given to you when you put your faith in Jesus. And we are told that the Holy Spirit has gifts that he wants to use, that he wants to give us supernaturally. And we've been talking over the last couple of weeks about like the idea of we've been given a gift in the Holy Spirit. And yet it can be so easy just to be more about it's like, oh yeah, I accepted Jesus Christ. I, I believe I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and cool. I'm going to go to church where they'll talk about it and sing <laughs> songs about it. And I can learn about it. Right? And, and we're just happy carrying around our Holy Spirit. Just like, and we're like, well, wait a minute. The Holy Spirit wants to move in you and through you in supernatural ways. Don't you want to open that up and, and, and allow that to happen? Nope. I will just learn about it and sing songs about it. And this is what we do. And we go through the motions of church or we go through the motions of religion when God wants to come alive in us. God wants to do these things. And I was thinking about it this week and what came to my mind, because this is a pretty significant part of my life, is my smartphone, right? Now, they say that a smartphone is able to let me go on the internet. It will allow me to play games and entertain me. It'll let me watch videos. Um, phone calls can come through here. Text messages can be sent through here. And here's, here's what I believe. I believe all that can happen. In fact, I want all that to happen. I want there to be phone calls. I want there to be text messages. But what does it say about my belief and about my desire and my expectation if each morning I just leave this on the table next to my bed. And then I go out about my day and that just stays right there where it is. What does that say about my belief and my expectation? I, I may say, yeah, I, I may say I believe it. I may say I want it and I expect it. But the reality is, as long as I don't take this with anticipation that, man, somebody's gonna text me. Somebody's gonna call me. There's gonna be some app that one of you are gonna say, I have to have if I wanna be cool. <laughs> and I, I, I'm ready for that to happen. The same kind of thing is, is what we can do with the Holy Spirit, where we, we get the right theology, okay? That's our belief in God and, and what we, we believe about God. Where we have the right theology 
and we nod our heads and you guys come uh, each Wednesday and, and you smile at me and you, you nod your head so that I, I feel like, like you, you listen and you care about me. And that, that's all lovely. And then it's so easy for all of us, me included. Nine o'clock rolls around. Legend sounds really good. We walk out the door and we leave God on the table. And we don't walk through our day with any kind of expectation that this God we say we believe in, this God that we, we believe is, has filled us if we've put our, our trust in Jesus, this God that will nod our heads when I say, God wants to work miraculously in your life. And we leave it on the table. And tonight, what I wanna challenge you with as we get into discovering more about these spiritual gifts, these gifts that the Holy Spirit wants to give us, is what do you expect from God? What do you anticipate a relationship with God is really like? Does it look anything like what we read about in God's word to us? Do you anticipate this kind of thing happening? Here, here's what happened. Jesus left. The disciples are all standing there and Jesus does like a David Blaine thing and just floats right up into the sky and <laughs> just, just, he didn't explode. He just disappeared. He, but before Jesus left, here's what he said. Don't leave. Don't scatter. Don't go on about your lives. Don't leave this on the table. Instead, go back to Jerusalem, gather together and wait for the Holy Spirit. So these guys putting action to their theology, went back to Jerusalem. They went up into this room above a house and they sat there and they waited and they waited and they waited. And I'm sure at some point, the guys are checking their sundials, wondering how much longer they're gonna have to wait. And they're thinking God's taking too long. And why doesn't God come when they want him to? And on all these things, but they waited because they were anticipating, they were expecting that God was gonna move. And guess what God did? He moved in a powerful, miraculous way. And the Holy Spirit came and he filled them and their lives and their ministry was never the same because they expected and they anticipated God to move. What do you, and this is for each one of you because, and your response is gonna be different. What is your expectation of the Holy Spirit moving in your life. It may be something you've never even thought about, but what do you anticipate God may call you to? What, do you, what are you open to and willing to allow God, allow the Holy Spirit to do in you and through you? When you came here tonight, what was on your mind? I can't wait to see that boy, he's so cute. And I am, I, I get it. But I, what was on your mind when you came here? Oh, I hope we sing this song that I really, really like. Oh, I hope enough of my friends are there. I hope the foosball table isn't too crowded. All reasonable kinds of things. And I will confess to you that it is easy for me as well to just make that the height of my expectation. What do you anticipate the Holy Spirit wanting to do in your life? The Bible tells us, God's word tells us that God wants to work supernaturally in your life, meaning beyond your abilities, beyond what you could practice and get good at, God wants to work miraculously in your life. And spiritual gifts are abilities that every believer possesses, that is given by God, given by the Holy Spirit as he sees fit, to anyone who puts their faith in Jesus for the encouragement and the building up the, of the church. This is why God gifts us. He wants to move supernaturally in us, not to make you cool, not to make you hyper-religious, but so that the body of Christ and the world around us that is lost will see that there can be hope, will see that there can be life in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you ready for that to happen? Are you willing 
for that to happen because it may mean that you experience things differently than you've ever experienced them before. Who's ready for that? And there are times I have to think about it. Like, uh, I don't know, I'm pretty comfortable. I kind of got this youth pastor thing down. Okay, I've kind of got a, a routine going here and it's like, eesh, what if God decides to change that a little bit? What if he wants me to use the clicker with my left hand? You know, <laughs> whoa. Sorry, got a little crazy there for a minute. <laughs> what are we willing to allow God to do in us? There may be results on this spiritual gift assessment that are a surprise to you. For those of you that took the assessment, um, you may have some results. You're like, I don't know how this fits for me. I don't know what, what I'm supposed to do with this. And that's okay. There may be, or there may not be, some results on there that you're like, hey, I am that. I am a leader. I am an administrator. I want to be an apostle. Right? And we need to understand this, and I'm going to say this every week. You, nor an assessment, get to decide what spiritual gifts you get. It is up to the Holy Spirit of God to do that in you. What is dependent on us is our willingness to open our hearts and our lives to let the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do. So right now, bow your heads, just so you're not distracted. It's not more holy or religious. It's just so you're not distracted. Bow your heads. Before we go any further, I want to give you the opportunity to go before God and invite him to do his work or not. It's really your choice. There's no magic words. You don't have to sound religious. You don't have to use Christianese. Simply invite God. Invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you tonight, to stir something up in you that he wants to do in you. Holy Spirit, we don't want to just go through the motions. We need you to pour out your power on us. We need you to move among us. God, I know there are those here tonight who feel so far from you. And yet you said that through Jesus, you are in us. And so God, I pray right now that you would reveal yourself to each person in this room. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would stir stuff up in us that we cannot ignore, that we cannot push aside, and that you would move in power in this place. That this youth group would never be the same. That we would never settle for routine. But we would be open to whatever you have for us. So we, so we invite you here tonight, God, to do your work. In Jesus' name, amen. As we get into a few more gifts tonight, I want to remind us of a bit of what we talked about last week, a gift versus a talent. A gift, I mean, a, I'm sorry, a talent is something, we all have talents. We all have things that maybe you are, you are able to do physically because of your body structure or you have just a natural talent of balance or strength or intelligence or something like that. And we can take, and we can take those talents and we can develop them. We can practice and get better at things. But for each one of us, with all of our talents, there is a ceiling. There is a limit to how good we can get at something, either because it's just at the end of our ability or physically, we just aren't able to do anymore. And there is a limit, there's a ceiling to that. A gift is something supernaturally given by God that goes beyond our abilities. It goes beyond what we could practice. It goes beyond what we could try real hard and do because it's given by God. It's given the whole, by the Holy Spirit. And so as we talk about these gifts each week, 
we need to understand that we're not talking about, when I talk about somebody who's spiritually gifted as a leader, what I'm not saying is, all right, there are people who are good at, leader, at being a leader and people who have the spiritual gift of leadership are a little bit better. We're not talking about that. This goes beyond our natural ability into God leading us into a new realm of leadership, a new realm of administration, a new realm of apostleship and starting uh, ministries and facilitating ministry. So tonight, when we talk about evangelism and teaching and shepherding, we're not talking about people who are just really good at these things. We all know people who are really good at stuff. We're talking about a supernatural ability, a divine ability that's given to us that goes beyond however much you could practice and get really good at something. So this is, a, again, about seeking God and inviting him to do his work. So, first one, evangelism. An example of this we find in Acts 8, all right? And if you have your Bible, you can open up your Bible to Acts 8. You can, uh, the gifts are alphabetized in your, page 11, page 11. Um, there's a story of Philip. Philip was listening to God. And God said, hey, I want you to go down this road. Didn't give him any other instruction than that. Didn't tell him what was going to happen. But Philip, believing that God wanted to use him and wanted to be in a place where God was going to use him, Philip goes down this road. And as he goes down this road, he sees this entourage. Okay, Bentleys, rolls, camels, donkeys, you know, all <laughs> kinds of things. And there's a carriage and he... he feels the Holy Spirit prompt him and say, this is where I want to use you. And instead of being afraid and intimidated by all the people and, and this important looking guy in a carriage, instead he goes, all right, Holy Spirit, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but use me. He walks up and he hears this Ethiopian eunuch who was a very high power official from Ethiopia reading the ancient scriptures. And immediately the Holy Spirit begins to speak to Philip and give him insight into this, this guy is lost. This guy doesn't know me. So Philip steps up and he says, hey, do you know what you're reading? And the guy's really honest. He goes, uh, not really. I'm just doing this because I'm supposed to. And Philip begins to tell him about Jesus. Philip begins to explain a relationship that can be had with this heavenly father. Philip begins to use language that the guy can understand, that the guy can connect with, to help him understand that he needs God's forgiveness and that it's only through a relationship with Jesus that this guy is going to be able to see heaven. And Philip's ability went way beyond being a salesman, being a slick talker. This was God speaking through Philip, giving him the ability to lead this guy into a relationship with Jesus. The definition of evangelism is the divine enablement. Remember that, right? The God-given ability, the divine enablement to effectively communicate the gospel to unbelievers so they respond in faith and move, to, move toward discipleship. How many of you here tonight are here tonight because somebody at some point told you about Jesus and it made you like, oh, that's interesting. I, I want to find out more about that. Raise your hand. You're not alone. Yeah. My guess is somewhere in your life, there was someone who was moved by the Holy Spirit with the gift of evangelism to communicate this to you in a way that made you go, you know what? I need more of that. I need to understand more of what that means and I want that relationship. Some of, the, some of the traits of an evangelist, someone who's sincere, candid, respectful, influential, spiritual, confident, committed, and oriented. And a person who operates under the spiritual gift, and this is maybe one of the ways to, to understand, you know, is, is this me or is this the way that God moves me? Is they have a passionate desire to make Jesus known. 
There was a guy in high school who he would walk through his school and his testimony is I'd walk through my school and I would get choked up because all I saw was lost people, people who needed Jesus. And he said, I would go and I would sit in my classes and I would, there are times I just, I'd feel nauseous at the thought of people not knowing Jesus. So he decided his junior year of high school, he was just going to start telling people about Jesus. Didn't care what they thought of him. He, he just, his need that the Holy Spirit put in him for people to know Jesus was just like, I, I don't care what kind of reputation I get. And he started telling people about Jesus. Some people blew him off. Some people responded. He started inviting them to youth group because they're like, you got to hear more of this. And, and so he started bringing youth, uh, people to youth group. He calls up the youth pastor eventually. Uh, some months go by. Calls up the youth pastor and goes, hey, so I've been bringing people um, to, to youth group and um, they're like accepting Jesus. And it's, it's awesome. And now they're telling people, um, we can't all fit in my mom's minivan anymore. Um, is there any way we can use the church bus? Within six months, within six months, the church bus was having to make two rounds to pick up friends of this guy because he was bringing 50, 60, 70, 100 people to youth group every week just because he's going around to school going, you've got to know Jesus. Evangelism. Now, you may hear that and go, oh, well, then I'm not an evangelist. How many of you have evangelism on your, on your like, packet? Raise your hand. Okay, so you may hear that and be like, well, I'm not that. Okay, maybe you're not that right now. But are you open? Are you open to allowing God to stir that up in you? Or maybe you felt that stirred up in you. You have had that burden in your heart and you've dismissed it. You got now. Oh, I, I don't want to be that, or or I, I. They would never listen to me, and you've dismissed it. And maybe this is a reminder that God wants to use you in that way. Here's a part where we can become prepared. The basis of an evangelist is that it they know the truth of God. Do you know the truth of God? Are you in God's word? It doesn't mean you have all the answers. It doesn't mean you understand everything perfectly. But there is a point where for an evangelist, we have to be prepared. We have to be ready with the truth of who God is and what he says. So what does this look like? Somebody who tells the good news of God's love through Jesus and his desire for a relationship. That's what an evangelist does. It also looks like someone who shares Christ-centered truth and corrects misconceptions. An evangelist, somebody with the spiritual gift of evangelism, when they're standing around in their, their group of friends and somebody goes, oh yeah, God just wants to send everybody to hell. Whoa! And they can't just like let it go and be like, uh, let those misconceptions or those untruths keep going. And they go, no, 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 I gotta tell you the truth. This is what an evangelist does. And the effect of an evangelist is that they move people toward Jesus, to accepting a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't know how God wants to use you in evangelism. By the way, he wants to use all of us, okay? We, when, if you don't have evangelism, maybe you're sitting there, you're like, Ooh, I don't have evangelists on my list. I don't have to do any of that. No, you're not off the hook. We are all called to go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to do this. But there are people that the Holy Spirit chooses to gift with this burden in their heart for the lost and gives them a supernatural ability to connect to people and to share with them the truth of Jesus. Teaching. Who has teaching as one of their, one of their gifts? Okay, a few of you. Cool. Now, this is one of those ones that you may have your, uh, this idea of, all right, teaching. Okay, teaching is one of my spiritual gifts. Okay, 24. Teaching is one of my, is one of the ones that comes out for me when I take one of these, these assessments. Now, you may look at that and go, 
Well, yeah, you have to. You're up there all the time. But there is more to teaching than somebody who stands up in front and talks. There's more to it than somebody who just instructs. In Acts 8, uh, uh, sorry, not 8, 18. Sorry, that should be in 18. Um, 1824, Apollos is this Jewish guy who has come to faith in Jesus. And yet he, and, and so he's telling people about Jesus, but there is a limit to where he's at. And so when he comes to this town, um, when he comes to Ephesus, uh, he's been teaching people and, and has been really enthusiastic and getting people all excited about Jesus. But a couple of people, Priscilla and Aquila, these ladies hear him and they go, okay, there's more. That, see, you're stopping here. Everything you're saying is accurate and true, but you're stopping here. There's more. There's the Holy Spirit. And they begin to instruct Apollos on the depth of relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. Then when Apollos goes out, it says he goes back out and he went up against the Jewish leaders who knew all the doctrine and all these things. And he was able to teach them through the power of the Holy Spirit in ways that it says, using the scriptures, he explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah and many people came to know Jesus because he was empowered as a teacher to declare the word of God confidently. So the definition of the spiritual gift of teaching, the what? The divine, the divine enablement. To understand, clearly explain, and apply the word of God, causing greater Christ-likeness in the lives of listeners. This is a teacher. Not just somebody who instructs, but someone who's able to understand something they're studying, something they're able to clearly explain. Have you ever had a hard time, like, like you get it, but trying to explain it to somebody else, just like, yeah, not gonna happen, right? Some of you may have teachers like that. You're like, yeah, you're not connecting with me here, please. But someone who's able to clearly explain and Apply the word of God. So this isn't just explaining, all right, this, 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 and this, but how it applies to your life. What does this look like to make it real to you? A teacher, someone who is divinely enabled to teach is able to do this. And the spiritual gift of teaching has these qualities, okay? Someone who's perceptive, and practical. God gives this person the ability to have insight into a situation and see how it applies. And they see it in a practical way. And then when a question comes up or a topic, <laughs> uh, friends are talking, they're able to say, hey, but you know, you know how that, that glass of milk was sitting on the counter the other day? Well, that milk you know, and they're able to somehow turn it and explain the gospel in that way. Okay, that's teaching. They are authoritative and articulate. The Holy Spirit empowers this, this person to speak when it's time to speak. It doesn't mean they're always speaking. It doesn't mean they're the only ones who have something to say. But when the opportunity comes to speak, they can speak with authority. They can speak with confidence and assurance that God is using them and God is speaking through them. Again, there are all kinds of people who are incredible teachers. <coughs> are you willing to believe that God could supernaturally empower you to teach? In a way that you walk away and you're like, wow, I, I explained that better than I ever thought I could. And it ends up leading people to Jesus. Here is one of the the keys though to teaching. Teachable and analytical. A teacher, someone who is empowered by the Holy Spirit to teach is not somebody who's just talking off the top of their head, saying anything that comes into their mind. They consider what needs to be said. They analyze it. They analyze scripture and go, what is this really saying? Not what do I think it says? What is this really saying? 
And a teacher has to be teachable. A teacher has to be someone that is allowing others to speak into their life, that is learning from other people, that is learning from scripture. If someone claims, oh, I've got the spiritual gift of teaching, so just let me talk at you. We need to consider what does this look like when the Holy Spirit is really moving in them and they need to be teachable. They need to be somebody that is listening and growing themselves. So how does this look like in your life? It's somebody who's not being shy to speak with authority on biblical issues. It doesn't mean the person's not shy. Teachers can be introverted. It means when it comes to biblical authority, they're willing to step up in a one-on-one -on -one conversation or in front of people, whatever, and speak with authority. They're willing to, again, correct truth and misconceptions. And they love God's word and they love studying it. They don't want to just teach their lessons and what they think will get a laugh or, or will be interesting to people. They want to dive into God's word and go, I, I want you to move God. I want you to speak to us. Last one. Sheep herding. <laughs> it's not sheep herding. Shepherding. Shepherding. 23. How many of you got shepherding on your, wow, okay. How many of you own sheep? <laughs> okay. Let me read this to you. Let me read this to you. First Peter chapter five, starting in verse two. This is the example and this is the charge for that was given to the elders of the church, to leaders of the church, this idea of shepherding and people with the spiritual gift of shepherding grab onto this and, and operate this way. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. Here's the definition. The? To nurture, care for, and guide people toward ongoing spiritual maturity and becoming like Christ. <laughs> Let me make this really practical for you. For all of you who thought this was dumb because you don't even own sheep, <laughs> let me make this really practical for you. How many of you have a relationship in your life that you need to nurture? How many of you have a relationship in your life that you need to care for? How many of you have the opportunity to guide people in some way. See, someone who has the spiritual gift of shepherding looks at a relationship and is not going to be okay just kind of walking down the road with, with a person and just being like, oh yeah, yeah, this is, this is my buddy or this is, and yeah, he's going through stuff and I'm just kind of here. Someone who has the spiritual gift of shepherding, God will break your heart for them. God will burden your heart for the needs of other people to where you are incapable of just kind of going, yeah, man, they're going through some really hard, that stinks. But instead, they want to come alongside. They want to encourage. They want to teach. They want to evangelize the people in their life that will lead them to becoming more like Christ. So you're going to see shepherding, this gift of shepherding, go along a lot of times with things like mercy, compassion, faith, empathy, these different things that are what God uses, what the Holy Spirit uses to draw you into a relationship with people to care for people. How this looks in real life. 
being a friend through pain, but not just being a friend, hey, I'm there for you, buddy, but actually being for them, buddy. Encouraging believers to walk out their faith. Here's the way shepherding can look like in a, what shepherding can look like in a group of believers. You're unwilling to let a group of believers just say they're believers. And yet nothing else in their life really looks like that. They're not really allowing God to lead them. They're not really living for Jesus. They're just saying they're believers. Someone who's a shepherd wants to come alongside those kinds of Christians and say, wait, there's more to this. There's life in this. Let me walk with you into relationship with Jesus. But a shepherd also models a pursuit of Jesus. A shepherd is an example of what it means to pursue Christ to be open to the Holy Spirit moving and to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is doing and how he is leading their life. So shepherding is very much about relationship. And maybe some of you who have shepherding, you've just thought you like people. Oh, I'm a people person. It could very much be the Holy Spirit leading you to be, to shepherd the people in your life, whether it's a sibling or friends or whatever. Maybe this is something that the Holy Spirit is stirring up in you going, hey, I want to use you in the lives of the people around you. Evangelism, teaching, and shepherding. There's all kinds of crossovers. There's all kinds of ways that these connect. There are all kinds of opportunities that if you get out of, out of like religion mode and thinking that it's, okay, well, this, this is something that doesn't have anything to do with me, you're going to find all kinds of opportunities in your junior high, in your high school, in your families, with your friends. But the first thing that we all need to come to an understanding is these are gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. This is not you trying to be a good teacher or trying to be a good friend. This is a supernatural ability. So tonight, as we head off to our detour groups, I want to encourage you to really consider how are you sensing God is stirring this up in you? And again, I don't care whether it's on your, on your uh, assessment or not. If this is something that God's stirring up in you, let's respond to that. Let's share what this may look like. If you've got questions, ask questions. If nobody in your group has this on their assessment, it doesn't mean that nobody in your group is going to be used evangelistically, teaching, or shepherding. Are you willing to go before God and say, I, I want this to be real in my life and I'm open for the Holy Spirit to use me supernaturally beyond what can be explained without the Holy Spirit?